Ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues, alums, and students, I am Siddharth Ghosh, Chair of Natural Sciences and Mathematics. This is indeed a happy day as we enter into a new era of doing science at Dominican University of California. Our science center represents more than just a building. The building houses a premier center for biomedical sciences and clinical research. The science center has nine state-of-the-art art teachings, seven research, and five special instrumentation laboratories. Please, when you get some chance this morning or this afternoon, the center is open for you to browse through, and we'll be there to show you around. Our sincere appreciation also goes to all members of our community for their unlimited support. Indeed, we developed a strong curriculum that offers students the opportunity to become scientists, K-12 math science teachers, biotechnologists, conservation biologists, and professionals in the areas of nursing, occupational therapy, pharmacy, dentistry, optometry, veterinary, and medicine. In fact, for the past two years, we have had a 100% acceptance rate of our students into some of the prestigious graduate school, medical schools, and industry in the nations. We have established research excellence at the national levels in the fields of mathematical modeling, biotechnology, alcohol addictions, biofuels, marine biology, including coral reef, sudden oak death, health and recreation, non-native weeds and fish parasites, cardiophysiology, including arrhythmia, natural products for mental health, breast cancer, and indeed stem cells. We have established collaboration at local, national, and international levels with prestigious universities, institutes, industries, and community organizations, including Bach Institute, Biomarine, National Park Service, and Zero Breast Cancer. Also, we have collaborations with Soroptimist International of Novato, Novato Public Access Television, NAPT. We really want to thank them for their help recording this conference. We are co-sponsoring co this event on stem cells with one of our community partners, Zero Breast Cancer. In labs, Worldwide, scientists are turning to stem cells to help in the development of treatments for ailments including stroke, heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, Parkinson, Alzheimer's disease, spinal cord injury, burns, and cancer. However, the public still knows little about this vital field of research which holds great promise for future therapies and cures. Indeed, stem cell science is so new that many Americans never learned about it in school. Scientists view stem cells as the body's repair system, as these cells have the potential to develop into many different cell types in the body. There are two types of stem cells. Adult stem cells are found in mature tissues that can self-renew and give rise to other cell types from their tissue of origin. Of course, you're going to hear a lot about stem cells this morning and this afternoon. At Dominican University, for example, students are learning to culture, maintain, and manipulate mouse embryonic stem cells in order to understand the embryonic development of neuroendocrine cells, the hormone secreting cells that control most of our vital functions. In an attempt to demystify stem cell research and involve our community in discussion about new developments in this field, Dominican University and Zero Breast Cancer have invited you to hear from some of the leading stem cell researcher and ethicist today for our half-a-day conference. 
entitled The Promise of Stem Cell Research in Human Health. Scientists from Stanford University, the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, the Buck Institute for Age Research in Novato, Dominican University of California, the, the University of California, San Diego, and the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine will discuss what stem cell research involves, how it may be used, and what scientific, ethical, and legal questions it raises. Our discussion today will focus on potential benefits of stem cell as applied to disease, uh, broad concerns such as breast cancer, fertility, and reproduction, and disease associated with aging. Throughout the conference, I hope you'll have the opportunity for meaningful dialogue and reflection among all those, among all of you present here. The goal of this participatory approach to research is to build public capacity to contribute, comprehend, and most importantly, use research findings to inform future personal and scientific decision making and public policy. With that, of course, this thing cannot happen with our academic leadership at Dominican University of California. I would like to welcome our provost, Dr. Kenneth Parada. Good morning, everybody. Oh, come on. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Parada. I'm the provost here at Dominican University. And uh, first of all, you'll notice that I'm not on your program at all because I was scheduled to be out of the country. And I became quite ill a couple of days ago. And uh, showing no sympathy, Dr. Ghosh <laughs> yesterday found me in the hallway and said, why don't you come and do a welcome? And I said, okay, I'll do that. Uh, so... <laughs> It is, it is my pleasure on behalf of the president, the faculty, the staff, and the students of Dominican University to welcome you all to our, our small but we think beautiful campus. Uh, Dominican University has undergone uh, unbelievable growth and transformation over the last several years, and one of the areas of that is in our sciences. Uh, as Sibdas said, we have a new science center. We are trying to partner in uh, very important areas of research, and this is one of them. Uh, we know that stem cell research is, is quite important. We're really, really, really proud to be a part of this conference. We welcome you to our campus, and please have a productive day. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, I'm Martha Nelson, Dean of Arts and Sciences here at Dominican University, and I am on the program. <laughs> and I would uh, just like to add my welcome to those of Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Parada. Um, we are very pleased to collaborate with Zero Breast Cancer in bringing you this conference. I have been familiar with Zero Breast Cancer when it was, in its early days, when it was founded as Marin Breast Cancer Watch by Francine Livian. It's a model organization, one that began as a grassroots activist group and has matured into a valued community partner. It has spearheaded funded research, public policy, and educational programs that are addressing the many questions we have about the rates and risks of breast cancer in Marin and the Bay Area. The, their goal is clear to us all, zero breast cancer. I attribute the success of this organization to its exceptional leadership. For the past six years, it has been Janice Barlow as executive director. Janice earned her BS in nursing from the University of California at San Francisco. She did her graduate work at the University of Washington, and she is a pediatric nurse practitioner. She brings to the organization a combination of wide-ranging experience in community health care and extensive personal involvement in health advocacy, community activism, community-based partnership, and participatory research, and nonprofit organizations. Through Janice's efforts, the National Institute of Environmental Health is now actively involved in investigating the causes for Marin's high breast cancer rate. 
She is the principal investigator on an NIEH grant focusing on community-based participatory research. She is also the community partner in a National Cancer Institute funded breast cancer survivorship study. Under her leadership, Zero Breast Cancer has piloted an adolescent breast cancer prevention, risk reduction, and education program and developed a breast cancer and environmental environment peer education toolkit. Janice's membership on scientific and community advisory boards is impressive. I really don't know how this woman has time to brush her teeth. They include, among others, the Marin County Women's Health Study, UCSF SPORE Breast Cancer Center, the NIEH Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Center Steering Committee, UCSF Comprehensive Cancer Center Community Advisory Board, and the Marin Cancer Institute Multidisciplinary Survivorship Committee. So it is my pleasure now to introduce to you Janice Barlow, Community Activate Extraordinaire. Gosh, thank you very much. I hardly recognized myself. <laughs> it's wonderful. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm, can you hear me if I stand up and don't touch? Okay. Um, I'm very honored um, to have the opportunity to welcome you to this community forum on the promise of stem cell research in human, in human health. Um, as um, Martha pointed out, I, this organization was founded in 1995 by a small group of dedicated women all of whom had breast cancer, who set out on a remarkable journey to find out why Marin County has had, has historically, actually since 1947, had such high incidence of invasive breast cancer. And the reason we exist today is because we as an organization find the current rates unacceptable. So the mission of Zero Breast Cancer is to find the causes of breast cancer through community participation in the research process. And so some of you might be wondering, um, what is the connection between the mission of Zero Breast Cancer and this morning's community forum on breast stem, research, breast stem cell research? Um, and there's a very strong uh, connection. You know, as Marty pointed out, um, Zero Breast Cancer is the community principal investigation on a major research initiative called the Breast Cancer and the Environment Research Center. And the underlying research question for, for this center is, is whether there are periods of vulnerability in the development of the mammary gland when exposures to environmental agents may initiate changes that can lead to breast cancer in, in the adult. At the center, there are two um, scientific studies being conducted. One is an epidemiology study that is um, being headed by Dr. Larry Cushy from the Department of Research at um, Kaiser. And it is looking at the environmental and genetic determinants for the early onset of puberty in 440 young girls here in the Bay Area. And the second study is being um, conducted at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and UC San Francisco. And the um, principal investigators are uh, Dr. Mary Helen Barcellus Hoff, who will be speaking later, and Dr. Zena Werb. And they're investigating the environmental effects on the molecular architecture and function of the mammary gland across the lifespan of mice and in breast cancer cell lines. So until being involved in, in this center, I had always just thought of stem cell research in association with diseases of aging or spinal cord injuries. However, as a result of being involved in the center, um, I now know that the recent breast cancer studies based on stem cell research that are being done by Dr. Zer Werb and Dr. Barcellus Hoff and many other um, scientists Will, have a, will contribute um, significantly in advancing our understanding of the causes of breast cancer and will help us in designing more effective therapeutic strategies. 
As an organization, we felt a responsibility to our community who supports us and to the women in our community who have breast cancer to share this information with them. So that was the idea behind um, our idea about doing this um, conference. So in, in the process, we couldn't have found a, a nicer partner, um, Dominican University of California, um, who have been wonderful. Uh, I, and I just would like to point out a few people, Dr. Sibdis Gosh, um, also Sarah Gardner, who did the publicity. There was tremendous publicity. Um, Maureen O'Keefe, who is also part of the PR um, department. Um, Mohammed Madouji, who is um, right there. Um, uh, Safi Yagubi, um, who was working with us, who's an environmental epidemiologist. And certainly, not last, is Kirsten Burzon, who orchestrated the, the whole event. But I think the, not only the terribly competent people <laughs> and wonderful people uh, to work with, but I think one of the reasons this partnership works so well is because both Dominican University of California and, and Zero Breast Cancer, through their own research and educational programs, have experienced the tremendous benefits that come from involving students, community members, and different scientific disciplines early and often in the research process. So the goal, as Sibdas pointed out, uh, we're using a participatory approach, and it's to build community ca capacity to contribute, comprehend, and most importantly, use the research that's the findings that are coming out, not just for stem cell, but all the research that's being done on these different diseases, and to be able to use it and to understand it in a way that um, you know, benefits helps you make decisions and helps us um, you know, make public policy, relevant public policy. So this forum represents a unique opportunity to involve the community, community in an ongoing dialogue. So I see this as kind of our first, first um, conference, but we'd like to do it again to keep people you know, up to date on the progress that's being made in, in stem cell research in these various diseases that are of concern to our community. We believe that this interactive dialogue between research and communities is especially important in areas of research such as stem cell research, which will have social, economic, and health-related impacts on, on our communities and our societies. So we hope that throughout the day you will, you will join freely in this conversation. And then finally, you know, our, our vision is to make zero breast cancer a reality for the next generation. And I, you know, as we look at the next generation, our daughters and our granddaughters and our sons, you know, we're passing on things from this generation. We're obviously passing on our genes. We're passing on a huge economic deficit. And I feel really strongly that, you know, we as adults have a responsibility not to pass on to the next general generation um, these diseases without having you know a better understanding um, or better treatments. So I so I I see it as our responsibility to make sure for the next generation that we we understand how to prevent these diseases and how to better treat them. So thank you. So just a little housekeeping. Um, following our next speaker, um, there will be question, questions and answers. And so we hope you um, actively participate in that time. And then um, following that, we'll have a coffee break, which will be back at, at you know, the Sports Center. And then we'll start back here at um, 1045 for the panelists. So it's my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Gilberto Sambrano, um, who is the senior scientist at the California Institute for Regenerative um, Medicine. He lives here in um, Marin County in San Rafael, and his wife um, grew up here in San, in San Rafael, and they have a lovely, I'm told, daughter <laughs> who's 18 months, um, which I'm sure she is. Um, so they're a part of our community. Um, Dr. Sembrano trained with the Cardiovascular Research Institute at the University of California, San Francisco, and he later accepted a fac faculty position in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Pharmacology. 
In 2001, he took a notable position to coordinate efforts of the Alliance for Cellular Signaling, a multi-institutional and multidisciplinary consortium, um, which was at UCSF, um, and it had it was trying to approach science uh, in a novel and innovative way. And then he also, for several years, he served on the UCSF Chancellor's Committee on Diversity and as president of the UCSF Postdoctoral Scholars Association. So he's been part of um, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine for two and a half years, one of the first people who, who was hired and has kind of built that um, institute from nothing to where it is now, which is has been a significant evolution, and he'll he'll talk about talk about that. And you know, one of the things um, I did was read the strategic plan, and it's on their website uh, for the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. And if you're interested in looking at it, and one of the things that I was very struck by um, the strategic plan was these these centers. Um, sense of responsibility to communicate not only with the lay public but also with um, those um, individuals who were most likely to benefit from the kind of research that's that's being done and that's a major part of their their strategic plan and I think also um, what I was very also impressed with was as part of any of these stem cell research grants that are being given out in California all of them, all of the researchers have to um, undergo, undergo a, um, uh, a training in the ethics around stem cells, and they and they all of the centers have ethicists, uh, biomedical or bioethical ethicists as part of their centers, and it's a requirement for getting the grants. So I, I think they've been very forward thinking um, and are doing a good job of using our money. <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Gil Gilbert Samburo. Okay. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. I want to thank uh, Dominican University and Zero Breast Cancer for featuring the CIRM so prominently in your program. Um, we love to have the opportunity to share with you uh, the, the public, the people of California, what it is that we are about uh, and what it is that we are doing. Um, so I, I wanted to um, speak to you today about enab enabling stem cell research in California and how it is that the CIRM and uh, perhaps even the public can uh, participate in doing so uh, and why it is important uh, to do so. Um, somebody had recently asked me, this was just a couple of days ago, what is it like to work at the CIRM? And it made me reflect on a game that I used to play in, in, in grade school, um, which was, perhaps much like dodgeball, uh, our PE coach used to call it machine gun run. And so he would line up kids in facing each other in this gauntlet, and they had those big rubber balls that they were all armed with. And so, of course, we had to run right through that gauntlet to get to the other side. And we had to be very focused in that mission to get to the other side, but of course we were doing so as a lot of the kids were throwing these balls and we had to kind of duck and tuck uh, to make it to the other side. And so in many ways that is what we have been doing at the CIRM, uh, is uh, dodging balls and, and as I go through this talk, I think you will see uh, evidence of a lot of that. But um, stem cell research uh, in, in general, you will find, I hope I'm doing this right. Can you, thank you. Um, has, kind of lives in a very, very murky place. Um, stem cell research is 
kind of embedded in, in a web that links it to many other things, politics, uh, religion, ethics, and law. Um, when you hear about stem cells in the news, perhaps, it's usually not in its pure form, but rather associated with some scandal that might have occurred. Uh, it might be associated with policies or political positioning. And so for anybody who is trying to get an understanding of what stem cell research is uh, and what the promise of stem cell research could be, um, I think it may be a challenge to grasp that. Um, so what I want to do today are a couple of things. First is to try to remove a little bit, uh, or at least for a while, some of the extraneous elements from stem cell research and tell you why it is that scientists are excited about it and why it spurred the creation of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And second, I want to tell you about the institute uh, that is a critical element in California, uh, why it exists, uh, who we are, what we've done, and what we hope to do. Can I, there we go. So I want to start out first by telling you what a stem cell is. I think it's very critical that we uh, are all on the same page about what it is that we are talking about. Um, so very simply, a, a stem cell has two very basic characteristics. Um, it is pointer doesn't work, but um, it, it has two basic characteristics. It is a cell that can mature and specialize into other cell types that have um, uh, very specific functions. And second, it can renew itself so that it can continue uh, to produce cells that are much like itself and have and carry the same potential. So in this illustration, you m might start with a stem cell that is labeled as pluripotent, meaning that it has a potential to become perhaps all of the different cell types that are found in your body. And it might give rise and transition to another cell type, another stem cell that has more limited capacity and can produce another subset of stem cells till you get perhaps to a blood stem cell. And that blood stem cell will give rise to all the different types of blood cells that you have running through your uh, system. Um, and that blood stem cell will sit somewhere and will allow you to maintain all the cells that you have. And this is a process of renewal that occurs quite often and every day in your body. So that is essentially what a stem cell is. Um, and the capacity of a stem cell, as you might uh, have garnered from that previous illustration, um, tracks in parallel with development. So if you think of an embryo that has to give rise to an entire organism, those stem cells have a potential to each create all of the different cells of your body. But as we grow, and if you were to gather cells from a fetus or an adult organism, that potential slowly and progressively begins to decline. So taking cells from an adult means that they will have a more limited capacity in their ability both to renew themselves as well as to uh, produce all the different cell types. Um, stem cell research, and more specifically human embryonic stem cell research, uh, got spurred on in 1998 when Dr. James Thompson uh, was able to, for the first time, derive stem cells from an embryo and culture them in the laboratory. Um, this was a, a tremendous finding because it meant that perhaps for the first time we could take human cells that we could, uh, in a dish, culture and have them differentiate, specialize, and create different tissues. Thank you. Um, the embryos that were utilized for this type of research have typically been from in vitro fertilization, which is a, a process by which a sperm and egg are put together 
in the laboratory and it's allowed to grow to a stage where it becomes a ball of cells called a blastocyst. That takes a few days. I think others uh, who are expert in the area will tell you a little bit more about this as, as we get to it. But the important aspect of this is that embryonic stem cells are largely derived from what is called uh, a blastocyst stage embryo. And they produce and can produce uh, a stem cell lines. And once you have a stem cell line, those cells can propagate indefinitely. And so the idea is that you can, from those cells, have the potential to produce in the laboratory all the different types of cells in the body. And so what that could mean is that, for example, if you want to produce nerve cells or pancreatic cells that you want to study in the lab, you can do so. Um, you can potentially take those cells and think of cellular therapies or replacement therapies. Uh, but it is also important to note that this is just the beginning, as was alluded to very early on. This is a very young field. And so what scientists are currently doing is trying to understand the mechanisms that will allow a human embryonic stem cell, a pluripotent cell, to become and direct itself to be a nerve cell or a pancreatic cell. What is it within the cell that allows it to do so? And how can you direct it in a very specific way to one cell type without allowing it to become a different one? Um, and so there are still many questions that need to be addressed in terms of the science. Um, thank you. And so if you think about stem cell research then, what it is really, it's an enabling technology. Um, it's one that might enable us to replace tissues uh, that are diseased or injured or damaged in some way. It may allow us to deliver drugs to specific sites in the body. Uh, they might provide models of disease that you can study in a dish. Um, they would perhaps allow us to screen drugs if you had in culture cell disease cell type that you derive from an embryonic stem cell you could test uh, hundreds or thousands of different drugs in a dish to see what effect they might have on those cells. And of course, another very important thing is that it can teach us and provide us with basic knowledge of human development. It is otherwise not possible to uh, understand it unless we utilize uh, human embryonic stem cells. Uh, obviously, it is difficult to do so uh, in vivo in humans. So overall, this is a, a path that can bring us to new therapies and cures for many diseases. So I want to talk to you next about another um, aspect of, of stem cell research and where perhaps uh, feathers have gotten ruffled and where questions begin to arise. And so you will also see now as I mentioned, stem cell research is embedded uh, and layered on with uh, ethical issues, uh, politics, and religions. And you will begin to see that we will be adding back some of those layers. And it's, it's almost impossible to separate it out from it. Uh, very early on, there was a, um, uh, a process called somatic cell nuclear transfer that um, in which you can take a, a human egg in which the nucleus has been removed and introduce a donor nucleus from an adult cell, so let's say a skin cell. And this would then produce a blastocyst from which you can take human embryonic stem cells and create then a cell line as I previously described. And this is a very powerful technique because it allows then the ability to create cells that are specific to a patient. So it means that issues of uh, rejection uh, by your immune system uh, are taken into account because these are like your own cells if you were to take a nucleus from yourself and, and go through this process to create uh, embryonic stem cell lines. Now, the interesting thing is that this very basic technique, although powerful, is also the way in which uh, 
Dolly the sheep was cloned and how uh, animals are cloned. So it, it set up the question of will scientists be suddenly interested or wanting to clone people? And so that, of course, is not the interest of scientists. It is not something that uh, scientists uh, uh, proposed to do. Um, but it did, as I mentioned, ruffled feathers and brought ethical questions uh, into play. Um, there's another aspect of this as well. I think the idea of what an embryo is uh, that contributes to uh, the development of human embryonic stem cells. Um, and perhaps there are misconceptions when one thinks about what an embryo of this type looks like. As I described to you, uh, a blastocyst from which human embryonic stem cells are derived is one that is at a very early stage of development before it ever implants in the uterus. And of course this is done in a laboratory uh, where such embryos would never be allowed to uh, develop into uh, an organism and cannot on their own. Um, but I, I want to just give you a little bit of, of perspective because uh, in thinking about what these embryos uh, are and what the perhaps perspective of it might be, um, sometimes it helps to see what the scale of a human embryo uh, at this stage or a human egg would be. And so if any of you have a penny in your pocket and you examine it and go to where the letter R in liberty is, you could probably nestle uh, a human egg within that little crevice of the R. So it's, it's, um, it's important to note this because oftentimes uh, the embryos from which um, human embryonic stem cells are derived are often seen as uh, uh, more developed uh, organisms, which they are not. Um, nevertheless, um, in 2001, there was a, an executive order by the president that uh, affected human embryonic stem cell research uh, quite deeply. Um, in, in his mind, it was a, a compromise. It prohibits the use of federal funds on embryonic stem cell lines that were derived prior to the day he made this decree, uh, August 9, 2001. Um, it meant that only lines that existed up until then uh, could be used uh, because the life and death decision on the embryos that they were derived had already been made. Uh, and uh, this executive order and prohibition extended to all uh, use of federal funds, which included the use of facilities. And so you can imagine that this uh, had a great impact on scientists' ability to conduct research in facilities that were uh, produced or funded by the NIH. And so scientists were quickly trying to find ways in order to allow this research to move forward uh, to find alternate ways of supporting it and funding it. Um, and so there were many states uh, that responded to this. Uh, in a uh, nation where biomedical research is largely dependent on the National Institutes of Health, it was very interesting to see that individual states put together programs uh, that would allow funding of uh, embryonic stem cell research. Uh, California was the first and has been the largest, uh, but certainly not the only one. Uh, states like Connecticut, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, uh, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, and Ohio have all put uh, together uh, institutes or programs of, of varying uh, funding amounts that would allow scientists to uh, further uh, stem cell research. Um, and if we come back to California and California's uh, response, uh, we had Proposition 71, which was passed in 2004, uh, November, approved by 59% of California voters. Um, 
Overall, it authorizes $3 billion uh, for stem cell research uh, over what it projected to be a 10-year period. Uh, it affirmed the right to conduct research that's not supported by federal funding. Uh, but also, very importantly, it banned reproductive cloning. Um, and quite interestingly, the federal gov government has not uh, banned uh, uh, reproductive cloning because it has not yet passed any, uh, uh, other than the executive order, any laws that actually address uh, um, reproductive cloning or therapeutic cloning. Um, Proposition 71 also required the development of medical and ethical standards, which is key and very important in moving forward with this work. Uh, Proposition 71 created essentially two entities. Uh, one was our board, which is the Independent Citizens Oversight Committee, which is composed of 29 members. Uh, it is chaired by Robert Klein, who was instrumental in authoring and moving Proposition 71 forward, uh, and Vice Chair uh, Dr. Ed Penhote, who is one of the uh, founders of, of Chiron. This uh, board is uh, a very large for uh, a board. It, it contains um, individuals who are part of medical schools. Um, uh, it has representatives from companies. It has also, very importantly, representatives from the patient advocate community. Um, so it tries to balance uh, um, the interests of both academia, um, uh, biotechnology and pharmaceutical companies, as well as the interests of the patients and the public. Prop 71 then, of course, also created the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which is the vehicle through which the $3 billion are to be dispersed uh, in California to research scientists. And uh, very recently, we recruited uh, Dr. Alan Trounson uh, from Australia, who uh, amazingly um, retired his lab and decided to take on the challenge of being the permanent president of our California Institute. So we were very pleased uh, to have him uh, a, on board, he just started this year, so he's been on the job only for about a month and a half, um, but it's, it's great to have him. Um, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, um, by uh, Prop 71, is limited to only 50 members. So it means that we will always have a small staff by which we can function and do our duties. Um, we have a very important mission statement, one that came about uh, through the strategic planning process that Janice talked about, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as, as we go forward. But it's important to, to uh, tell you what this is uh, because it's key. Uh, it is to support and advance stem cell research and regenerative medicine under the highest ethical and medical standards for the discovery and development of cures, therapies, diagnostics, and research technologies to relieve human suffering from chronic disease and injury. And as uh, one of our uh, patient advocate uh, follow followers said, it's basically turning stem cells into cures. And that is the goal of the Institute. Um, Proposition 71 also uh, puts together three different working groups um, that utilizes the expertise of individuals, uh, scientists who are outside of California uh, for uh, grants review, for uh, coming up with policies and regulations that affect the overall ethics and standards by which we function and by which those who receive funding from the CIRM are expected to function. Uh, and there is also a, a working group of real estate experts uh, to put forward policies on uh, facilities and to approve grants that would go towards the, the building of uh, very important facilities in order to conduct human embryonic stem cell research. 
Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go back now to describing a little bit about what uh, building um, a state agency and a fund funding agency uh, entails. Uh, the CIRM started out uh, with a very small group of people following the passage of Prop 71. And it had a very, obviously, uh, a big mission and uh, a lot of things that it had to do very quickly in order to begin to fund stem cell research. Uh, we had to build a, a granting agency from the ground up. Um, and already uh, the CIRM was being compared to the National Institutes of Health in terms of the expectations. Uh, you know, we had to start uh, making things happen in order that we not lose um, the time that scientists were losing under the federal restrictions. So, so building a state agency in California meant understanding uh, what a state agency involves, and there's, there's a lot, let me tell you. It's, uh, <laughs> It is, it is something that has posed a challenge, both because we have had uh, state auditors uh, on board uh, several times to ensure that what we do is, is by the book uh, and that we are um, utilizing the, people of, the people's money uh, appropriately. And I think we, we've done well in demonstrating that we have and that we are setting up procedures and policies that uh, do exactly that. Uh, but again, we're also building a, a, a funding granting agency, which requires more than one would think. Uh, I, as a scientist who, who worked uh, on the bench, never realized the infrastructure that's required to support all the research that is done uh, by scientists. And uh, it, it involves uh, quite a lot as well. Um, if you j begin to think about how one tracks money that goes to specific projects, it requires a whole grants management system, a whole infrastructure that can track and record all of this. One has to consider compliance issues, ensuring that every um, investigator that uh, funds go to uh, is doing what they propose to do and doing it in a way that meets all the uh, ethical and medical uh, standards that are put in place. And we also need to track what it is that they do and what they've accomplished so that we can ensure that we are uh, achieving our goals, that we are achieving milestones in getting uh, to where the mission of the CIRM uh, is headed. Uh, but of course, nothing is ever easy. Uh, and once again, we are, are dodging balls. And one of the biggest was the, the legal challenges that we have faced uh, which took uh, over two years, really, to resolve. Uh, there were two consolidated lawsuits that essentially came on very soon after uh, Prop 71 was passed, uh, which challenged our constitutional authority to spend state money. So if you can't spend state money, you can't fund scientific research. So we were uh, a bit in a bind. Uh, and had to find creative ways to make it work and still have an institute that could survive through the litigation process. Um, in May of 2006, the Superior Court uh, of California upheld the CIRM position, which was uh, very quickly appealed, and so we were still uh, in limbo for quite a while. And it wasn't until May of 2007 that finally the California Supreme Court declined to hear the appeal and it allowed us to, to move uh, forward with issuance of bonds uh, and uh, freed up the uh, money for research. There was incidentally also a third lawsuit which was uh, dismissed, which asserted uh, that the CIRM was depriving frozen embryos of their uh, constitutional rights. Um, so in, in being creative and trying to find innovative ways of making an institute work without funds, uh, 
required, actually, uh, I think the work of Bob Klein. I think he was very instrumental in making this happen. And one of those things was something that I had never heard of, I don't think most people had ever heard of, uh, which were bond anticipation notes, uh, which was essentially the idea that if you could get somebody who was a very generous uh, donor, really, to provide um, money that we would pay back once we could issue bonds, uh, and they could agree to that, that would allow us to get started. And that's, in essence, what these bond anticipation notes were. Uh, and um, there were several uh, very generous uh, uh, individuals and organizations that helped us through uh, by supporting the Institute for those two years. Uh, there were uh, 14 million uh, dollars that were uh, raised uh, by April of 2006 that allowed us to fund the very first program, which were the training grants to 16 institutions uh, then. And then we garnered an additional 36 million for research grants. Um, very interestingly, we also garnered 150 million, which really allowed us to move forward about a year and a half ago that was provided by the governor. Uh, and this was just following the presidential veto on a bill that would have uh, eased restrictions on the use of, of um, human embryos for embryonic stem cell research. So as we move forward, now that we have funds, what do we do? We have uh, $3 billion in about 10 years to spend it wisely. And so part of this process involved making a plan. Um, and that is what Janice referred to as a scientific strategic plan, which is essentially the blueprint of what the CIRM hopes to accomplish over a 10-year period. It defines the long-term objectives that we will pursue over 10 years. This process was one that we had to, in order to make a good plan that was going to work, uh, one that was going to serve the people, involve interviews with all the different stakeholders. That included scientists, clinicians, ethicists, patient advocates, public interest groups. Um, we had around 200 individuals that uh, we had either personal interviews with uh, or in some way uh, garnered their input. We had f focus group discussions uh, where we brought groups, different groups together. Uh, one was focused on patient advocates, another was focused on uh, diversity. Uh, many of our meetings uh, held in public to garner input from the general public. Um, and it was also important that this strategic plan be a living plan in that as we grow and as we learn, we will have to evolve because new technologies, advancements will contribute to what it is that we uh, can do and may change the perspective on what we thought we could do. And so the strategic plan takes this into account and provides mechanisms uh, for reviewing what it is that we've done and for modifying the plan as we move along. Uh, the basic framework of this plan uh, kind of takes into account the general progress of any uh, a drug development scheme or uh, a scheme by which you uh, take a basic science discovery and get it to the clinic or to patients. Uh, and so across the top, you see laying the foundation, which is really uh, the basic science trying to establish facilities enabling uh, the, the basic aspects of stem cell research that will then allow us to eventually prepare for the clinic and take those uh, promising ideas and potential therapies uh, through clinical research uh, um, studies. And each of these uh, also take into account different resources, uh, including um, 
the scientific training, which is key and important as we move forward. Uh, training is a key element in, in stem cell research if it's going to move forward, uh, beginning from undergraduates to graduate students, postdocs, who um, need to understand both the scientific aspects and ethical aspects of the research so that one day when they have their own laboratories and are conducting research, have a better understanding of it. Um, of course, innovation is, is key, and so something that the strategic plan intends to promote through its initiatives. Uh, tools, technologies, uh, obviously the creation of facilities, and uh, also building of communities, uh, both among scientists so that we have communication among scientists, uh, sharing uh, data, sharing their results, um, and it is, it is an essential aspect uh, for uh, science to move forward. Um, and then there's also the responsibility to, to the public. Um, participating in forums such as this one, uh, sponsoring forums such as this one, um, and uh, essentially taking every opportunity we can to share what it is we do and describe what stem cell research is about. And so putting all that together, we create what are then funding initiatives. And each funding initiative is uh, posted and advertised uh, on the web so that scientists can uh, seek uh, f uh, and apply for funding uh, for those specific initiatives. Um, the strategic plan also has several goals that it has uh, uh, put in place. And it divides them into two types. Uh, the aspirational goals, uh, which very simply is what we hope to achieve. Um, and they're very straightforward and really just two of them, which is to utilize stem cells to cure a wide variety of diseases and to uh, bring California to a place where it is considered a world leader in stem cell research. Um, we also have identified several commitment goals. And these are essentially our pledge uh, to the people of California for what it is that we can achieve practically in 10 years. And um, these require just a little bit of context. Um, one has to consider that stem cell research, as was pointed out, is scientifically a very young field. There is much to learn, and it will take much more than 10 years to really see it all through and really understand what the full promise of stem cell research will be. Um, it is also important to point out that traditionally, therapeutic drug development, uh, as it's known today, takes time and it fails more often than it succeeds. Um, typically, the development of any drug when it gets to the point of beginning phase clinical studies is at least an additional seven to nine years. So we are trying to make a 10-year plan in which it takes seven to nine to bring a drug to, um, to patients. Um, so that is also something that has to be taken into account. And also, the idea of cell replacement. Cellular therapy is something that is very new. Um, it hasn't really been traditionally done other than in the form of uh, bone marrow transplants, uh, which is actually a little bit different uh, from this. So there are still questions and issues that need to be discussed with FDA that need to be uh, considered in order to move forward. Um, but. Given that, we have set out several goals that are described in the strategic plan uh, for those 10 years that are largely focused on human embryonic stem cells and with an emphasis on cellular therapy. And two of these goals, which are the, the two of the 10 that are described in the plan, is to have clinical proof of principle that transplanted cells that were derived from, from pluripotent cells, uh, uh, meaning human embryonic stem cells uh, or the like, can be used to restore function for at least one disease. 
Uh, a second goal, that therapies based on stem cell research be in phase one or phase two clinical trials for at least two to four additional diseases. Um, and so that, that is our, our goal. Um, what those diseases are or will be, I don't know. But what we hope is that we can spur and inspire scientists to move forward uh, so that we can achieve them. Um, so then I want to describe to you a little bit about what we've done, laying the foundation, how we've gotten started so that we can get to those goals. And so that's in the form of several initiatives that in the last two and a half years we've put together uh, and begun to, to fund. Um, the first is one that I have been perhaps the most intimately involved with, which is the CIRM training program. Um, it is one that we are very proud of because it is the essence of how we get started. That is, to train young scientists to do research. The, the training initiative uh, funded 16 nonprofit institutions in California, uh, which provide support for up to about 169 trainees at the predoctoral, postdoctoral, and clinical fellow levels uh, to train in stem cell research. It requires that there be a course in stem cell biology as part of their program, as well as a course in the ethical, legal, and social issues. Uh, an annual meeting of these trainees is sponsored in order to bring them all together. And again, to begin to, to uh, create a community of scientists, beginning with the youngest, who as they grow will uh, uh, forge um, friendships and collaborations with each other. Uh, these grants were awarded in April of 2006 uh, 38 million over a three-year period. And again, this was during the time when we were still uh, in uh, legal throes, and so it was through creative funding that we were able to sponsor this program. And of course, I'm happy to say that we are continuing on with this program and expect to have another uh, uh, initiative that will follow for another three years uh, uh, very soon. Uh, we also had a jumpstart initiative to enable stem cell research. Um, it is um, one that would allow human embryonic stem cells to move forward uh, in, in as quickly as possible um, and uh, focus on scientists who have innovative projects uh, as well as those investigators who uh, have more broad um, more mature projects, which were the comprehensive research grants, and also would begin to provide space uh, through shared lab space. Um, we have several initiatives that are ongoing now to support new faculty uh, to get them started in the critical uh, time of their careers when they are spending most of their time trying to write grants and get their research labs together. Um, uh, ones that will sponsor the development of new cell lines, utilizing new techniques and new technologies. And one very important one, which is the disease team, that will sponsor the creation of teams that will bring basic scientists, clinicians uh, together to address uh, critical diseases. So what's next uh, for us? Uh, as I mentioned, we have a new president uh, who has just gotten started. Uh, but we are all looking forward to uh, uh, moving ahead with his vision and insight. We have new initiatives that we will uh, carry forward, hopefully, uh, into the clinic. Uh, we will be uh, further developing funding for for-profit companies, continuing community outreach, and, of course, growing the, uh, the, the institute. Um, I want to thank you uh, for this opportunity, but I also want to acknowledge a lot of key individuals who have supported the uh, creation of the CIRM, uh, helped us uh, and supported us uh, at very critical times. Certainly Bob Klein, Zach Hall, Arlene Chu were critical in, in creating this institute. Um, so thank you very much.